Welcome to the weekend edition of Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that for over 50 years has been changing lives through God's unconditional love and grace. You build yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost of Jude chapter 1, verse 20. It's up to you how excited you are, how full of joy you are, how anointed you are, how encouraged you are. It's God's power, but you're the one that activates it. And now, here's Andrew. The Lord really laid on my heart just how to stay positive in a negative world. And I've already quoted that verse out of Proverbs 13, 12, that hope deferred makes the heart sick. And it just, disappointment, when, you're, when your hope gets put off. Again, I haven't lost hope, but I was hoping for results right now that we aren't seeing. And when you see it deferred, when you see it put off into the future, the scripture says it makes your heart sick. How do you keep your heart from getting sick? If the body of Christ gets discouraged, we're the, we're the hope for this nation. And I'm not only talking about just in the political sense and saving this physical nation, but we're the hope for people. If we aren't uh, encouraged in shining forth the light of God, uh, I can guarantee you the ungodly aren't going to do it. So we've got to keep ourselves encouraged. And you know, I'm saying this just as a praise to the Lord. I'm not giving myself a pat on the back, but it's been now 53 years since I had an encounter with the Lord that just lit a fire on the inside of me. I've been born again for 63 years, but for 53 years, man, I have been passionate and seeking the Lord. And I, I'm saying this, you can disagree with it. I have people challenge me on this all the time and say that you're lying. It's not true, but this is my testimony and I'm sticking with it. Amen. That I haven't been depressed and discouraged in 50, well, let me say 50 years because it took a while to grow into this after the Lord touched my life. But for 50 years, I haven't been depressed. And I've had a lot of depressing things happen and I've had a lot of opportunities to be depressed. And I've felt depression, but I've learned how to stand against it and I am more encouraged today. I am more full of faith. I've got more vision today than I've ever had in my life. So I'm saying that this isn't something that I'm just preaching reactionary to what's going on. But for my life, for five decades, I have been able to maintain the intensity and the joy. And what happened in my life in 1968 is more real and more alive on the inside of me today than it's ever been. And as I've gone through ministry and talked to a lot of people, that's the exception rather than the rule. Most people are up and down like a yo-yo and they have highs and lows and they go in these periods. It doesn't have to be that way. I've got another teaching that would fit perfectly right here. I'm not going to teach on that this week, but I've got a teaching entitled The Four Keys to Staying Full of God based on Romans 1, 18 through uh, 21. And anyway, you can determine how full of God you are. It's up to you. And yet the average Christian is just approaching God like, oh God, would you please do something? And then they just passively wait on God to do something. But David encouraged himself in the Lord. You can keep yourself built up. It says you build yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost of uh, Jude chapter 1. Verse 20, it's up to you how excited you are, how full of joy you are, how anointed you are, how encouraged you are. It's God's power, but you're the one that activates it. And so anyway, you can keep yourself encouraged. Let me turn over and use something that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24. And this was Jesus. His disciples were asking him about what would be the sign of his coming. And so Jesus began to give some instructions about the end days, which are the days that we live in. Somebody says, how do you know it's the end days? Well, it's my end days. <laughs> Amen. So I'm, I'm doing everything I can right now. But here in Matthew chapter 24, in verse four, it says, and Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you. The very fact that he said that means that there's a lot of deception about this. So take heed that no man deceive you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. You know, when I was a kid, I read this verse, and I thought, who would ever say they are Christ? You know, Jamie and I were driving to church one day, maybe, I forget, a few years back, and there was a, they advertised a show coming on that said the Jesus Christ show. 
And I thought, well, that sounds interesting. So we listened and a man came on and he was claiming to be Jesus. And he, it was a call-in program. And uh, they asked, how do you deal with when people betray you and hurt you? And he says, I remember when I was hanging on the cross and people criticized me. And this guy was claiming to be Jesus. And it's a nationwide syndicated program, the Jesus Christ Show. It's not something that's going to happen in the future. It's happening now. It's happening in this nation. People saying that they are the Christ. And he says, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. This is amazing. He's saying that there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. And man, uh, I don't have to go into much explanation to tell you that that's true. I mean, you know, there are people, uh, I've got some connections with people over in Nigeria and stuff and the Boko Haram and stuff. They are going in and they are murdering people right and left. They're taking young children and making them sex slaves. And there are more Christians being martyred now than there have ever been in the history of the world. We are, we are in a violent world. There's bad things going on. And sad to say, many Americans have been immune to this and we just sit there and watch what's on television and sitcoms and things and are sitting here fiddling while the world is burning. But the truth is that there's wars and rumors of wars. But he said in the midst of this, see that your heart be not troubled. You know, this is completely contrary to what most people think. Most people think that if we are living in a bad situation, that you can't help but be troubled. Matter of fact, we, the church has been so influenced by psychology today that many people in the church, if you stand up and say that you can bless the Lord at all times, which is a command from uh, Psalms chapter 34, and it's a command to do it. And if you stand up and say that you can praise God and regardless of what's going on in your life, you can still be rejoicing and praising God if you stand up and say that, you will have a lot of Christians criticize you and start saying, you aren't compassionate. You're making me feel bad. You're condemning me because I'm struggling. I'm not condemning you, but I'm saying that you don't have to be depressed. You don't have to be defeated. Jesus mentioned that there are wars and rumors of wars, and yet don't let your heart be troubled. You have control over your heart. Or let me say it this way. You should have control over your heart. You can have control over your heart. You can determine whether or not you get depressed and discouraged. I tell you, the praise and worship tonight, Charlie and Jill, the songs that they picked, these were awesome songs. I had despaired unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. That's straight out of scripture. I love that song. You can sit there and choose to believe. You can set your hope in the Lord, your God. You can choose to bless the Lord. So Jesus right here is talking about, yes, there's problems. In John chapter 16, verse 33, he says, in the world you shall have tribulation. And if you look at it in context, this was the night before his crucifixion and he was going to be arrested and then uh, crucified. He could have said it this way. In the next 30 minutes, you're going to have tribulation. But then he says, but be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. He was talking to his people, his disciples, the night before his crucifixion, and yet he says, don't let your heart be troubled. He would be unjust to give us that kind of a command if you couldn't do it. So here he is talking about the end times. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars, but don't let that bother you. You can rise above all of these things. It says, for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences. Man, we are experiencing famines today on an unprecedented uh, scale. Pestilences such as COVID-19, pandemic that has affected the world. In my 71 years, I've never seen anything that even remotely resembled this. And he's talking about that these are signs of the end times. And there will be earthquakes. I've seen statistics. I don't remember the exact number, but uh, earthquakes are increasing at an exponential rate. There are more earthquakes happening today than have ever happened in the history of the world and in different places. And then in verse uh, 8, he says, All of these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up 
to be afflicted and shall kill you and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. You know, I remember when I was a kid reading this and thinking, well, that applies for nations that don't know the Lord, not for America. America, you'll never be hated for the cause of the Lord. But you know what? It's changed. I was just reading a few days ago that uh, Chris Cuomo came out against uh, Ted Cruz, I believe it was, because he was going to challenge the Electoral College and he called him the Bible boy and started criticizing him and ridiculing anybody who believed in the Bible. And did you know it has become fashionable to criticize Christians? And what is written right here, the Lord said you'd be hated of all nations. That includes the United States. And you know what? If you are standing for godly things today, you will be criticized. You will be persecuted. And in some ways, criticism and, the, and these things, not where they're taking you out and killing you or cutting your head off, but in some ways, this just uh, shaming you and the things that they say about you, it's actually a more damaging form of persecution. Because if somebody put a gun to your head and said, you renounce your faith in the Lord or I'll kill you, there's many of you that wouldn't go that far. But if it's going to cost you your job or if it's going to cost you acceptance among, say, family members or somebody, or they're going to exclude you or roll their eyes at you, there's a lot of Christians that wouldn't stand up and speak the truth. And they would submit to that kind of persecution, whereas when it's more, when it's bigger than that, they, w they wouldn't do that. In some ways, the, the subtle persecution is worse. And this says that you'll be hated of all nations. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12 says, Yea, all those who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you aren't being persecuted, it's because you aren't living godly. Anybody miss that? And some people are like, well, but we live in America. All nations. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, the time has come. It's way past time. But the time is definitely now that as Christians, we've got to stand up. And I can guarantee you, you will be persecuted. You will have people come out and call you a bigot or call you a homophobe or call you a hate monger or something else. But it doesn't matter. You've got to stand up. And you've got to start being counted. I had one of the questions at the school today when I was ministering at the school and they were talking about, but you know, I don't want to offend anybody. And so I don't want to say things that would offend them, hoping that they'll still stay around and I'll eventually get them. And I was talking to Kurt Owen as we were walking today and Kurt made a, a great point about this, about how that, uh, you know, Jesus offended people. And yet I can guarantee you he did the right thing. You can't judge by how people react what you're supposed to do. The truth is the only thing that will set people free. And we've got to speak the truth. And we've got so many people that have gone so far. I can guarantee you, yeah, there's going to be a lot of people offended when you say that you are a male or a female at birth. That may offend some people, but everything says that. Science says it. You could take a person who claims to be a homosexual and a hundred years from now, you could dig their body up and, and uh, analyze it and you could tell whether they were a male or female. Every cell in your body is either a XY chromosome or it's got two X chromosomes. And that's the way that God made you. And you don't get to pick and choose how you feel. That's not hating anybody. It's just biological truth. And some people are offended by saying that, but I don't intend to offend them. It's the truth that's going to set them free. If you shut up and don't tell people the truth, I guarantee you there's no way that they're going to hear the, the ungodly people say this. We've got to have the people that have seen the truth to stand up and speak. And if you do that, you will be hated of all nations. Now, overall, what I'm going to minister this weekend is how to stay positive in a negative world. But before I can give you the antidote, I got to show you that you got a problem. <laughs> Amen. So tonight may not be real encouraging, but please come back and let me give you the, the antidote to all of this stuff. But in case you haven't been paying attention, you've got to recognize that, man, things are spinning out of control 
And unless we stand up, unless we make a deliberate uh, attempt to deal with this, it's not going to happen naturally. You can't put your head in the sand and just say, well, uh, you know, let things blow over. No, we're dealing with a situation that this nation is headed in the wrong direction and you've got to be able to confront it. So I want to make this point. But again, overall, I believe this is going to be very encouraging uh, this week as I go through the rest of this. So he says in uh, verse 10, and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. This is nearly like I'm reading a newspaper. <laughs> this is happening. There are many people offended. And you can't always look at just because a person was offended and say, well, then I must not have done it right. Jesus offended people. His disciples came to him and says, didn't you know that the Pharisees were offended? And he says, if they weren't planted by my father, they'll be rooted up. He said, let them, the blind lead the blind. He says, it didn't matter that they were offended. When people are telling you that somehow or another, if you'll just walk in love, everybody will receive, everybody will love you. They're asking you to be more Christian than Christ. Jesus offended people. It's not always what the person says. It's the problem that the person has that causes them to be offended. So it says many shall be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another and many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And here's the verse I was really wanting to focus on in verse 12. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. This is Jesus speaking. This isn't saying that this is a tendency, that this could happen. No, this is saying this is what will happen, that when iniquity abounds the love of many shall wax cold. And if you look this up in the Greek, the Greek word for many there is P-O-L-U-S, polis. And uh, just so happens that that's the name of our governor, <laughs> polis. And he's an open homosexual and uh, just hates God and God's people. Uh, but the word means more than just many. It means most is what it really means. Here's, here's the amplified classic Bible's translation of this. It says, and the love of the great body of people will grow cold because of the multiplied lawless and iniquity of the great body. The amplified Bible says, because lawlessness is increased, the love of most people will grow cold. The NIV translation says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. So the point that I'm trying to emphasize is that when the King James says many, it's literally talking about most. As lawlessness increases, and in case you haven't been paying attention, lawlessness is increasing in this nation. It's been going on worldwide for a long time, but America has been the last best hope of, of the whole world. And I tell you, the things that we've seen this last year where there's rooting, looting and burning and all of these terrible things and, uh, you know, promoting anarchy and wanting to defund the police and on and on, lawlessness is increasing. And Jesus said that when that happens, the love of the great body of Christ is going to grow cold. Not just a few. He said that this would happen. The next verse here in Matthew chapter 24 shows you it doesn't have to be this way because in the very next verse it says in verse 13, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. So there are people that will endure this. You can overcome your love growing cold, but you can't do it unless you realize what's going on and you deliberately take a stand and encourage yourself in the Lord. It's not going to happen just naturally. It's not going to happen by you just trying to somehow or another put your head in the sand and ignore this and wait until it all blows over. And brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, the body of Christ as a whole in America, their love has waxed cold. 
And you know, this word waxed is really important because it's a word picture the way that they used to make candles back in the Bible day. They would take a wick and they would put it in hot oil and just dip it in there and then lift it out. And in just a second or so that, that or excuse me, hot wax, and that wax would uh, cool and it would form a coating on that wick. And then you dip it again and it'd put another coating on it and you'd dip it again. And a hundred times or 200 times, whatever, you would dip it. And that's the way that they made a candle. And this is exactly what this is talking about. It's a process. It doesn't just happen at one time. It's something that happens little by little and you compromise and you let one thing go and you don't seem to be bothered by that. And then the next time it's easier for you to let the next thing go. And it's a process And the body of Christ uh, in our generation, the last generation or two has just allowed things to happen. Prayer to be taken out of the school abortion to be legalized, and they have just incrementally given place and not stood up to all of these things. You know, this year we filed a lawsuit, like I said, against the state because they don't have the right to sit there and tell us that we can't meet. When the COVID first came out, you know, nobody knew exactly what was going to happen, and they were uh, saying that you needed to just, uh, for I think it was two weeks or 30 days or something like that, uh, you know, let's uh, withdraw and close things down. And so I voluntarily uh, submitted for a while just to be a good neighbor. But then they said that was for 30 days and then they extended that 30 days and then they extended it again. And, you know, we actually had the Republicans in the state of Colorado file lawsuit against the governor because the Colorado uh, Constitution gives the governor... Uh, these powers in an emergency to impose 30 days of restrictions. But after 30 days, it can't be extended without going to the Congress and getting the Congress to pass a law. The, the governor doesn't have the right to do this. And yet he's now into who knows, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, 30 day extension on all of these restrictions. And when I saw that there was no end in sight, we just sent a letter to the governor, had 704 pastors sign it. And I said, look, we're praying for you. We know it's a difficult situation. We submitted voluntarily, but our voluntary cooperation is over and we're going to start holding meetings. And um, anyway, the sparks flew. But praise God, we won. And so we're on top of it. But I, you, can't, you can't just give in. I guarantee you, if you give people power to violate what the Constitution says, they aren't going to give it back. You're going to have to take it back. We're going to have to stand up. And this same thing holds true here that you can't just give in to God, ungodliness. We've got to fight it. And if we would, you know, if the body of Christ would have stood and fought against adultery, there was a time that committing adultery was a terrible thing in the body of Christ. But that passed a long time ago. We gave in on that. And then the next thing, here you have the Bible taken out of schools and then you have abortion coming. And now you got homosexuality and you give place to that. And now it's transgenderism. And now kids get to choose their own sex and it just goes on and on. And we've allowed things to happen without standing up and fighting and pushing back. That's what this is talking about because iniquity abounds just time after time after time. It, it waxes cold. You don't go from just being passionate about God to getting to where you don't care about God all at once. It's a process. And if you would get to where instead of waiting until the final blow and it looks like, you know, you're just ready to totally renounce your faith in the Lord. If you would just draw the line and say, I'm not going beyond this. I'm going to stand for what the Word of God says. I'm not going to tolerate these things. And again, there's a balance. I haven't got time to put all this in balance. Hopefully, Dennis will do a better job when he gets up here and straighten everything out. But I'm not saying that you get to where you're hateful and you are just mean and challenging people, but you speak the truth in love. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. We have to speak the truth in love and grow up unto, into Him in all righteousness. We've got to speak the truth in love. The truth is the only thing that will set people free. And in case you haven't known, probably most of you that are here 
on a Thursday night, coming to a meeting like this, you probably agree with this, but this isn't just political correctness or something. This is demonic. It is demonic. Satan is out to destroy this nation, not just because of the nation, but because it was founded upon the gospel. It is a beacon of godliness. It has set a standard around the world. It's not a perfect standard. This isn't a perfect nation. We aren't perfect people, but I guarantee you, this is a uh, roadblock. It's a barrier for Satan. America has stopped a lot of ungodliness in this world and Satan is out to destroy this, not only for our own freedoms, but so that he can just destroy the lives of people. It is demonic. We are in a demonic battle and we need to wake up to it and recognize, I mean, this is one of the good things that can come out of all of the stuff that's happening is I believe Satan loves to operate uh, subtly under the radar transform himself into an angel of light. And he has been flushed out into the open. And I think that this, one of the good things that could come out of this, that if the body of Christ is paying attention, this ought to wake us up and recognize that not only our future, but our children's future, the future of millions of people, whether they go to heaven or hell, is at, at risk and that the body of Christ needs to wake up. And I believe that that's happening. Amen. I believe that there's really a lot of good things going on. You aren't going to hear about it on the news. But there's a lot of really good things happening. Today you saw a portion of Andrew's teaching titled, How to Stay Positive in a Negative World, recorded live from the Phoenix Gospel Truth Conference in 2021. This product that we're offering on how to stay positive in a negative world is something that you need. I can guarantee you we need to guard our hearts against this or our love will wax cold. This complete teaching is available as a CD or DVD album. Each of these valuable resources are available for a gift of any amount when you contact us. This entire series is also available for audio download absolutely free from our website at awmi.net. You can also order resources or receive prayer by calling our helpline at 719-635-1111. Our helpline is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. They were predicting in the 2020 elections that the Democrats would win another 15 to 20 seats in the House. They lost over 10. I think it was either 10 or 15 seats and stuff. There is a backlash. People are getting tired of seeing all of this stuff. And uh, anyway, I'm going to try and refrain myself from making too many comments on all of this, but there are positive things happening and I'll be dealing with that more. Turn over here to 2 Peter chapter 2. It's talking about Lot. He was talking about how God brought judgment upon the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah in verse 6. And he turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that, sh that after should live ungodly. I've had people before challenge me and say, the Bible doesn't even mention homosexuality. The word's not even in the Bible. Boy, how dumb can you get and still breathe? They didn't come up with the word homosexual until the late 1800s. No, the word homosexual is not in here, but Sodom and Gomorrah is a pretty good example of what God thinks of homosexuality. And this verse says that he used this as an example to those who would follow after. Go back and read Genesis chapter 19. If you have any questions about what God thinks about homosexuality, that should answer it. And in verse 7, it says, and delivered just Lot... That doesn't mean only Lot because his wife came out and also his two, two of his daughters 
And so he wasn't the only one who got delivered out of Sodom. This is talking about and delivered just lot, righteous lot. The same word that was translated just right here in verse 7, in verse 8 was translated righteous twice. So this is talking about that he delivered a just man. Lot was a godly man. Lot loved God. He was a righteous man. So in verse 7, he delivered righteous Lot or just Lot vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. This says that you vex your soul when you behold iniquity. This goes right along with what Jesus was saying that because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. There are still a lot of Christians that think, you know what, it doesn't bother me. I can watch these movies that have nudity in it, that have homosexuality in it, that have unfaithfulness to your mate, that have lying and stealing and cursing and profanity. And I can watch this stuff and it doesn't bother me. I'm strong enough to be able to handle it. I've had a lot of people tell me that. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, it says, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. If you are saying that, man, this doesn't bother me. I can, I can watch these R-rated, X-rated stuff. I can watch pornography. I can see all the stuff happening and it doesn't bother me. You're deceived. Thank you for that thunderous silence. <laughs> and I know that there's a lot of people that don't like this, but how many witnesses do you need? Jesus said that because iniquity abounds, the love of many is going to wax cold. Here we see that Lot vexed his righteous soul. Did you know the word vexed in verse 7 is talking about he tormented, tortured his soul. Notice it says he tortured his soul not his spirit. Of course, Lot was an Old Testament man, but in the New Testament, your spirit is born again. In the spirit, you're perfect. You're righteous and you're holy, but your soul is your emotional part, your personality part, and you vex, you torment your soul when you dwell in the midst of ungodliness. And I know there's some people right here thinking, well, you... This is the world we live in. You can't ignore it. You doc, God doesn't want us to go live in a monastery. I agree. We're the salt of the earth. To do any good, you got to get out of the salt shaker. We've got to be out into the world. I'm not saying that we just stick our head in the sand and ignore it, but you have to counter this. It's not, if you don't make a deliberate effort to stand up and persevere beyond the iniquity and stand against the iniquity that's around you, I guarantee you it will affect your heart. Your love will wax cold. You are not going to be an exception to what Jesus said. It can't happen without you deliberately on purpose standing against things. You know, in Isaiah chapter 54, verse 17, it says, No weapon that is formed against you will prosper. And then the next phrase says, and every tongue that shall rise against you in judgment, you shall condemn. There's a linkage there. Did you know that words are weapons? It's not coincidental that he says, no weapon formed against you will prosper. And then he says, and every tongue that rises against you. Words are weapons. Death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Words have life and death in them. And when you listen to ungodliness, when you listen to lies, when you listen to people that just ridicule and make fun of God and the Bible and godly principles, it's death and it's a weapon. And it says in Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper and every tongue that shall rise against you in judgment, you shall condemn. I'm not telling you to withdraw and get to where you stick your head in the sand and that we just don't even know anything that's going on and we refuse to uh, be a part of this world that we live in. But when you hear unbelief, when it comes at you, you have to condemn it. You have to stand against it. 
You have to say no in the name of Jesus. This is not right. You can ask Jamie that, man, I'm fanatical on this, but, you know, we'll be driving in the car and hear the news or something. They'll say it's flu season. And you can ask her, I'll say, not for me in the name of Jesus. I don't believe in the flu. They'll sit there and say, you know, have you gotten this? Or, you know, when you get over a such certain age, you'll start having this. And I'll say, no, thank you, Jesus. I don't have that. If you will hear unbelief and if you will counter it and speak against it, then it just loses its impact. You have to condemn it. But if you don't counter it, I guarantee you every word, not only your words that come out of your mouth, but every word that you hear uh, in music, in news, in whatever it is that you're listening to, every word is either life or death. And if you don't counter that death and say no in the name of Jesus, then those words are like seeds and it just immediately starts producing it immediately starts bringing something to pass. It immediately starts hardening your heart and putting a layer of insens insensitivity between you and God. And you have to stand against it. And brothers and sisters, this generation of Christians are exposed to more ungodliness, more doubt, more unbelief than I believe any generation of Christians that have ever existed. We pay hundreds and hundreds of dollars to have pornography and unbelief and hatred and strife and lies pumped into our home. That doesn't mean you have to watch it. I'm not against television. I'm on television. <laughs> I'm not against television, but I'm saying that there's an on and off button and you need to be able to be discriminating. You know, Jamie and I will watch some secular shows and stuff. We're, we're, it's funny because we were watching something the other day. I forgot what it was. But uh, anyway, the shows that we watch, typically, they're all old people shows. We watch Andy Griffith or uh, I don't know what else, uh, Hogan's Heroes or something like that. And all of the commercials are about sickness because it's only old people that watch it. But I sit there with a the remote and the moment a sick commercial comes on, man, we, we uh, mute it and I'll sit there and counter it and say something. And we were watching something where they were, I think it was a cartoon or something and they were advertising toys. And I said, man, this is refreshing <laughs> because they weren't advertising sickness. But I mean, even if you could find something decent to watch, the commercials will kill you. You got to learn to stand against this stuff. I'm not saying that you have to, you know, unplug and get rid of everything. I lived for 20 years without a television and you know what? I didn't miss it. And so I, I'm not saying that you'd be bad to get rid of all that stuff, but at the very least, you've got to get to where when you hear something contrary to the word of God, you condemn it. And you say, no, in the name of Jesus, this is not for me. And you can counter that ungodliness. But if you don't, here was a righteous man, Lot, who lived in an ungodly place. You know why? Because there was green grass. It says that Lot and Abraham had so many cattle and sheep that they couldn't dwell together. And so Abraham told him, he's, he took him up to a high place and he says, pick and choose which way you want to go and whichever way you go, I'll go the opposite direction. And if you've been over there to Hebron is where this happened. In the area of Hebron, I mean, you can walk two and three feet, six feet in between blades of grass. It's nearly desert. But down in the Jordan Valley, before Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, it was lush grass. You know, I've had horses a lot of my life and when I'd go rent a place or buy a place, I'd always look to see was there good grass. When you have animals, you think about things like this. And for Abraham to say, you just pick which way you don't want to go. Over here where there's great pasture land or do you want desert? There wasn't much choice. And so Lot chose the great pasture land and he moved into Sodom and he did it for the financial benefit that it would help him with his herds. He put that ahead of anything else. I tell you, that's just absolutely wrong. 
And today there's many people that are worshiping the almighty dollar and they will sit there and they will compromise their godly convictions. I've had people before sit there and say, but if I stand up, I might lose my job. Well, then lose your job. <laughs> and some people think, well, you aren't compassionate. There's some things more important than having a high paying job. And I guarantee you, keeping your, your love from growing cold is an important thing. And yet most people are putting more emphasis on, on a job. If you get a job offer, most people, it, you don't even consider, is there a good church in this place if I have to move? Is this what God wants me to do? No, the whole thing is about, is it a promotion? Am I going to get more money? And that's what most people would sell their soul out. And they don't even check to see if there's a decent church or they don't even think about the spiritual things. I'm telling you, that's wrong. There's, there's a lot of things more important than just finances. Lot, for whatever his reason was, he chose Sodom and Gomorrah, lived in a place where it was so ungodly that two angels came into the place and they wanted to have sex with these angels. I guarantee you, America is heading in this direction where they have parades and brag about homosexuality and now they're pushing transgenderism and men are competing in women's sports and taking away scholarships from women and just things are happening in the body of Christ. When are we going to stand up? There are some in the body of Christ standing up, but we need to all stand up. You know, we stood up in Woodland Park and we made a decision that we were going to still hold our meetings and stuff. And the city came against us and they served us with cease and desist orders and all of this. And praise God, we had uh, Liberty Council represent us and they did a great job and we won. But did you know if every church in Woodland Park would have stood up and have said no, that would have ended it. They wouldn't have done it against the whole body of Christ. But we just had one group that stood up. And because of that, they came out against us. If the entire body of Christ, if everybody would stand up and start saying, this is godly, this is ungodly, we aren't going to stand for this. I guarantee you, we could turn this nation around. But as long as there's just individuals standing up, they'll continue to fight against us. Every rank and file member of the body of Christ ought to stand up. And I love you all. I know that some of you are going to be offended. I don't mean this to offend. I'm, I'm meaning it to show us how desperate the situation is so that we will do something instead of just continuing until, you know, it's like a frog. You put it in the water and if it's boiling, it'll jump out. But you put it in cool water and turn up the temperature gradually and it'll stay there until it boils to death. I'm trying to keep you from boiling to death. I'm trying to let you know that it's time that you do something. So I'm, I'm not trying to offend you, but I can guarantee you there's many people in here that you, you go to churches that are dead. Dead churches. If they called 911, they'd have to carry out half of the crowd before they could find the dead person. You go to dead churches and you sit there and you let people speak against what the Word of God says. And you do this week after week after week and you think, oh, it's not bothering me. I can still handle this. I go back to 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. You're listening to speak, people speak unbelief and counter all of this stuff. I guarantee it's going to affect you. Oh, no, I'm a mature Christian. It doesn't bother me. You're deceived. Now, I don't believe that hearing one word is going to contaminate me if I stand up and condemn it and refuse to accept it. But for me to willfully just sit under and listen to unbelief over and over and over, then you're going against what the Bible says. You're going against what Jesus said. He said the majority of people, their heart, where their love will wax cold when they just, uh, iniquity abounds around them. We have the example of Lot and he was a righteous man, but seeing and hearing, seeing and hearing, their unlawful deeds from day to day vexed his righteous soul. It'll vex your righteous soul. It is vexing your righteous soul and many of us don't even recognize it. 
I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, we've got to stand against this. And we are, in a way, it's good. Because the body of Christ has been without criticism, without persecution. Most people see that as something that happens overseas. And because of it, they just haven't taken things serious. They've been a, it's been a sleeping giant. But you know what? I believe that this is waking up the body of Christ and recognizing that the reason this nation is in the mess that it's in, the reason that we see these riots and people storming the Capitol and stuff is because they have no fear of God in them. Psalms chapter 36 verse 1 says, The transgression of the wicked says within my heart there is no fear of God before their eyes. People have lost the fear of God. Fifty years ago, people were messed up. People didn't know the Lord, but they wouldn't just go in and start murdering people and killing people because they had a knowledge of God, a fear of God, and they knew that somehow or another they were going to answer to a God. So even though they may not have been living for Him, they knew that He existed and they didn't want to sit there and just usher themselves into a Christless eternity. But today, we got an entire generation that have lost the fear of God. They don't even acknowledge that God exists. So they go in and start killing people and then commit suicide thinking, I escaped punishment. They didn't escape a thing. They just ushered themselves into an eternity of punishment by killing themselves. A fear of God used to restrain evil. The transgression of the wicked says within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. People need to be aware of God. And how do they do that? Because the Christians are standing up and proclaiming that this is a godly way to live and this is an ungodly way to live. And you don't have to condemn the people. You can sit there and say, I love you. I don't want your life destroyed. You can do it in love, but you've got to speak the truth in love. Love does not set people free. It's the truth spoken in love that sets people free. Truth doesn't set people free by itself. It's got to be spoken in love. It's not one or the other. You got to have both. But I guarantee you, we've got to speak the truth. And so what I'm trying to do tonight is to just say that, look, this we are in a crisis situation, not only in this nation, but in the world. It's a crisis situation. We are moving towards the end times. And Jesus said that in these last days, as iniquity abounds, and that is abounding, the love of many or most is going to wax cold. And I guarantee you, it'll happen to the people right here. You are the exception. You're the fanatics that come out on a Thursday night to a convention center to listen to a hick from Texas talk. You're a fanatic or you were drugged here by a fanatic. One of the two. Like Anthony, his mother drew, uh, brought him here or something. But so you're the exception. And yet I can guarantee you that people sitting right here in this auditorium, man, your heart is, you know, your heart becomes sick when you see things that you've been praying for and looking for and you don't see them coming to pass. It'll make your heart sick. It'll make your, your love grow cold. And if you don't recognize what's happening and if you don't learn how to encourage yourself in the Lord, then I can guarantee you, you are going to grow cold. It's not, it might happen to some people. It happens to the majority of people unless you know what to do. So that's what I'm going to be ministering on this week. Tonight, I was just trying to discern what is the problem before you can give the solution to the problem. You got to admit that there's a problem and you got to, uh, start looking for an answer. So that's all I've tried to accomplish tonight. The rest of the time, I'm going to be talking about how to keep yourself encouraged in the Lord, how to do these things and share scriptural examples with you. And if you'll implement this, then I believe that you could be one of those in verse 13 where your heart's not going to grow cold, but you will endure to the end and you will be saved. But it's not going to happen unless you do it on purpose. This doesn't happen accidentally. It doesn't just happen automatically. It's something that you have to pursue. If you pursue it, you'll get it. And if you don't, you won't. So we need to be pursuing God. And the very fact that you're here, I compliment you for it. You could be doing a lot of things. You could be sitting at home watching as the stomach turns on television. 
and yet you came here. And so praise God, but you're going to have to do more than just come to a conference. You're going to have to learn how to take the Word of God and encourage yourself in the Lord. And so Dennis and I are going to be ministering things that I believe are going to build you up and help you and praise God. You can go out here instead of being part of the problem, you can be a part of the solution. Amen. Praise God. Thank you for watching the weekend edition of Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack. We hope you've been blessed by today's teaching. You can get the products on today's teaching as well as many other valuable resources when you visit our website at awmi.net. For over 20 years, Karis Bible College has been training and empowering students to know who they are in Christ and step into their God-given calling and purpose. Not only do we have our main campus in Woodland Park, Colorado, we also have extension schools in several locations all around the world. You can also participate in Karis Online through our distance education courses. If you're interested in attending Karis Bible College, visit karisbiblecollege.org to find a campus near you to discover all the ways you can attend Karis Bible College. If you're unable to attend Karis Bible College at one of these locations, we encourage you to consider enrolling in eCharis. eCharis has the entire first year curriculum preloaded onto an iPad. You can watch over 312 hours of teaching from Karis Bible College instructors anywhere at any time. No internet connection is required. To learn more about becoming a student through eCharis, contact us today. Andrew Womack Ministries has several offices in Karis Bible College locations around the world. To find a location near you, visit our website at awmi.net and click Contact Us. We want to say a special thank you to the Grace Partners of Andrew Womack Ministries. Your gifts make it possible to put free ministry materials into the hands of many people in need. If you're not already a Grace Partner, we ask you to pray about becoming one today. You can become a Grace Partner or order resources through our website at awmi.net. While there, you can discover more product details and download additional free resources. You can also order resources or receive prayer by calling our helpline at 719-635-1111. Our helpline is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. I would like to encourage you to check out our social media, all of these different platforms. We've got a lot of good news to share, so check it out, our social media for Andrew Womack Ministries. This is Selena's Grace Encounter. I had been brought up in religion, Catholic. You have to behave, you have to be good. My mindset was very legalistic. I remember actually writing a letter to God and saying, when I know who I am, I'll come to you. I was into smoking cannabis and drinking. When I was 15, I fell pregnant. I had her when I was 16, and then I went on to have her brother the next year when I was 17. And then the year after that, I had my next child. And then I had twins when I was 19. And then I had my youngest son when I was 20. The man I was with was really abusive. So as time went on, instead of smoking just for kind of fun, I would smoke just to kind of deal with life. The relationship was really quite bad. After about five years, it caused me to have a, I had a nervous breakdown. I decided that I'd had enough. So I, I don't want to be here, I don't want to be alive. And I thought, if I have a drink, I can just forget everything just for one day. But I got drunk, took my car keys and got in my car headed for the motorway bridge. But I didn't make it. Smashed into another car, 50 mile an hour. And I didn't have a seat belt on or anything. There was nobody else involved, just me in a parked car. I think my head hit the windscreen, my legs went through the dashboard, and then I actually got out of the car. And I remember thinking to myself, well, this is not good, I can't even kill myself. But I actually did start thinking about God and thinking about, you know, is this true? And I can remember sitting there thinking, what shall I do? I've got a Bible in front of me, and I've got a rolled up joint the other side of the Bible, and then I've got a knife the other side of the Bible. Shall I, shall I read the Bible, or shall I cut my wrists, or shall I just get stoned? 
Confused, suicidal, and with no idea where to turn, Selena met God through Facebook, right where she was. While scrolling through a friend's post, she learned about Grace and Faith, a free conference by Andrew Womack. And I went into the service, and they spoke a lot about righteousness. You also have a spirit part of you. The Bible says, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, all things are become new. You are a brand new creature that now has love, joy, peace, all of these things. You've been blessed with everything. Everything that you will ever have in heaven is already on the inside of you. While I was listening to it, it just felt like loads of things were making sense. And it was like loads of walls were coming down in front of me. And then I remember at the end when um, Andrew did the altar call for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I was thinking to myself, well, man, I, I, need, to, I need to go forward. And um, it was a good job he asked if there were people that weren't born again there. Because at that point I was thinking, you know, because I'm, I'm not born again. And he actually said, if there's anybody here that's not born again or doesn't know that they're born again, you need to be born again first. And I remember in that, in that instant right then, I remember hearing God speak to me because I spent all my life trying to work out who am I. And God spoke to me and he said, it doesn't matter whose family you belong to, you, you belong to me now. And in that moment, I knew that I'd been born again. And then instantly, he did, Andrew did the baptism of the Holy Spirit and I was baptised in the Holy Spirit and I was speaking in tongues and I was like, okay, this is all whatever. But I just remember feeling so, it was just like, it was, it was higher than I've ever felt in my life. I didn't know it right there and then, but I was just completely set free from everything. Everything that was drug addiction and being, wanting to kill myself, being depressed. All of that just left instantly. In a single moment, God showed Selena who she was, and just like that, she was free of addiction, insecurity, and all the labels she had believed her whole life. At the end of the conference, Selena knew she needed to become established in her newfound identity and enrolled in Karis Bible College Walsall, where in just a few short years, God has changed everything. Today, Selena is in leadership at Karis alongside her husband, Andrew, whom God redeemed from a life of violence. God spoke to me. Andrew, you can stay the way you are or you can change your life. The clearest point I remember was I had no more fear. I had no more anxiety. It was just total peace. As for her children, Selena has now become the mother they have always needed. Of course, none of this would be possible without our friends and partners. Because of you, one suicidal woman from England found her identity in Christ and is now spreading this message of hope throughout Europe. Thank you. If you haven't yet partnered with us, I'd like to encourage you to pray about it. And then if the Lord says so, join with us because we are taking the gospel not only through television, but we've got over 70 uh, different locations around the world, offices, I think in 16 different nations. Uh, we have uh, probably 8,000 students going through Karis Bible College at any time with over 8,000 graduates. We're pumping out millions and millions of free material through our website, over 200,000 free hours of material on our website, and we're just reaching all around the world. We couldn't do it without partners. And so I would like to ask you to pray about it. If you want to make a difference, I believe that this is a good ministry. You'll get a great return, not only in heaven, but in this life, you'll receive a hundredfold. So join with us and become a partner with Andrew Womack Ministries today.